to you. Is it more valuable when it's human? Sure. But what if an animal were almost human, like the chimpanzee? The genetic code of chimps is uncannily close to us, and that fact, as you're about to see, is one of the biggest threats to their well-being. In our quest for scientific breakthroughs, chimps are our unwitting guinea pigs, and many wonder if this is right. Should we use these animals for our purposes? Well, such questions are difficult to answer once you come face to face with these remarkable creatures, One, as recently I did. Zero. Fire, lift off. When signals from the bodies of the first space travelers were beamed back to mission control in the 1960s, the Air Force wasn't willing to risk human life. Instead, the astronaut in this early space capsule was the next best substitute, a chimpanzee. That's because chimps are more like humans than any other animal. Their brain, organs, and blood are so much like our own that they've become our best model for medical research. Chimps in the wild behave much as primitive humans did, making tools, hunting meat, dealing with complex emotions like friendship, depression, and hostility. The IQ of an adult chimp is comparable to that of a three to four year old human child. But what people don't realize is that being so human-like has its darker side. Long after their moment in history passed, the space chimps continue to live out their lives in the cages of research facilities, lives which may last as long as 50 years. These beings were slaves. They never had the choice. They were enslaved by the military for the purpose of performing experiments. Peter Singer is a professor of philosophy at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. He has been credited with starting the modern animal rights movement 20 years ago. Now we're saying it's time to recognize that it's not only humans who have basic rights and who really count as persons, but also our closest relatives. Singer and his colleagues have published The Great Ape Project, which demands that these creatures be recognized not as property, but as persons. Biologists have classified the great apes as gorillas, orangutans, and the closest human substitute, the chimpanzee. Of the great apes, the chimp is our next of kin genetically, sharing 98.4% of our DNA. But close as they are, chimps have never been able to reproduce human speech because their vocal folds prevent them from forming sounds as we do. But in 1966, the barrier was broken when a baby chimp named Washoe became the first non-human to speak American Sign Language. This early film shows Washoe signing one of her first words, open. She was smart enough to apply it to other things. Open. Open. Washoe's vocabulary expanded to over 130 signs. A young graduate student named Roger Fouts became Washoe's mentor. Today, Washoe is 29. Roger Fouts and his wife, Deborah, have graduate students of their own here at Central Washington University. They believe they have pushed sign language studies far beyond the early critics who claimed that the chimps were only imitating humans. All of the chimps here use sign language. Who's pretty? That's you, Debbie. Signing their own names. A finger drawn across the forehead means the color black. Hitting two fists together is a sign for shoe. They even use signs for moods and emotions. Oh, she just signed hug, hug, hug to Lewis. Incredibly, Washoe taught sign language to her adopted son, Lewis, with no human interference. One of my favorites was Washoe when uh, Lewis stole her magazine, ran off, and she disappears, and she gets up, and she looks around, and she says, dirty, 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 dirty. <laughs> the chimps can use hundreds of words. But most revealing is watching their thought process at work as they carry on a conversation. What's that? What's this? That's water. water. That's fine. Yeah, that's water. Right. Signing always fascinates me because what you're doing is you're getting a window into their mind. Yeah. I'm sorry. Coffee, 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 coffee. All right. It's my coffee. They're thinking aloud. When you talk to yourself, you're thinking aloud. As the years have passed, Roger Fouts has realized what he owes to the subjects of his language studies. He's become a contributor to the Great Ape Project, and he cautions any scientist working with chimps to consider the whole picture. The Great Ape Project is really looking at human responsibility. It's saying, if we brought them here, then we have to make sure that we give them a proper uh, way to live here. In, in other words, you can't send them back. You can't send them back to Africa. Roger Fouts' research center is far from the plains of Africa. 
Yet the chimps he works with here are fortunate. The great majority of the 2,000 chimps held in captivity in this country are used in biomedical research, routinely sedated so they can undergo liver biopsies, having their blood drawn, being injected with deadly viruses. They live out their lives in cages which measure just five by five by seven feet to make it easier for technicians to give them their shots. We visited LIMSIM, the laboratory for experimental medicine and surgery in primates, known for the humane care of its animals. Their chief veterinarian is Dr. James Mahoney. Reggie! We keep finding new viruses, and if it proves that the chimpanzee is the only animal model from which we can grow the virus in, then I'm afraid the chimpanzee becomes a candidate once more. In fact, chimp research has saved hundreds of thousands of human lives. The present vaccine for hepatitis B, a disease which is a major killer in the third world, could never have been developed without this kind of research. We always live in fear of the next unknown virus popping up. Let's face it, uh, somewhat more than 10 years ago, we didn't know about HIV. AIDS has become the newest focus of chimp research. Only chimps and humans can carry the HIV virus, although chimps never actually get the disease. Is it conceivable that without chimpanzees that you could do this work at all? In order to test a vaccine in a human being, you would have to take a person who had never been exposed to HIV before, allow you to inject them with the vaccine, and then say, I hope this vaccine works, because now I'm going to take a thousand times an infectious dose going to inject you with it. And if it doesn't work? We have an HIV AIDS infected person, so I don't think we could do that. But we did do human testing in the past. In the 1950s, retarded children at New York State's Willowbrook were fed live hepatitis viruses in an effort to find a vaccine. The same reason chimpanzees are injected with the disease today. And we look back on that with shock and horror, say how could that happen? I think that in another 30 or 40 years, people will look back with shock and horror on the fact that these sensitive, intelligent, caring, social animals, the chimpanzees, were locked up in small laboratory cages. Before they're old enough to spend all their time inside a cage, baby chimps spend their days in playrooms here at the Lemsip Nursery. They need the same loving affection and cuddling that human babies need. But by the time they're six years old, the chimps have grown too powerful to be controlled and are placed in cages with other playful juveniles. Experimentation for them has already begun. Eventually, they will be moved into the adult wards where a steel cage will mark their only home for decades to come. Because of the enormous similarity between the great apes and human beings, do we have a right to use them in this way? I personally don't think thoroughly convinced that we do not have a right. I can only say that we have a need. Give me that little hand. Do you ever feel bad about it and wish you were doing something else? Yes, every day, every night. Unfortunately, we do need to use them in research. That's my belief. But I'm not so thoroughly convinced about my rightness in doing so that I feel I can do it without having a terrible conscience. There she is. While Dr. Mahoney can sympathize with the intent of the Great Ape Project, many cannot, including Dr. Fred Colston, whose foundation runs the largest chimpanzee research facility in the world. Their concept that the Great Ape belongs to be considered along with man, in my opinion, is sheer not. It's an animal. Well, so is a human. It's an animal in every sense of the word. They have misinformed the general public as to what is the true nature of these large animals. They are dangerous, they're unpredictable, they don't just sit there and talk to people by hand sign. Uh, I don't know of any chimp that I would trust, and I don't know anybody in the right mind that would trust them. It's not what they would have in the jungle. It's better, perhaps. Last year, the Colston Foundation took over the remaining chimps from the original space program. After 35 years in research, the future for them will include more testing, this time for the diseases which afflict elderly humans. But the old question, do I ask the chimp, would you volunteer for this experiment, please? I can't. I can't talk to him. 
But what if you could talk to a research chimp? Sitting in a cage at Lemsip is 27-year-old Bowie, who learned to communicate in sign language from Roger Bouts 25 years ago. But Bowie was the property of someone else who sold him into biomedical research, where he remains as a part of a hepatitis experiment. What would happen if Bowie saw the human companion who had helped him learn to speak? Well, we arranged for Roger Fouts to fly across the country so that on a winter morning, the two friends could meet again. As we drove to the laboratory together, we wondered how clear Bowie's memory might be. Is it likely that Bowie will remember? You haven't seen Bowie for a long time. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what his life has been like for the past 16 years, what that might do to him. Uh, I, I hope he remembers. As Dr. Mahoney and I accompanied Roger to the long, windowless building which houses Bowie's cage, he wondered what signs, if any, Bowie would remember, like the sign for Bowie. And Bowie's name, his, his old name sign is... A line drawn across his head. Outside the door, Roger waited for the right moment, and then entered the room, hunched over ape-like, about to see what 16 years had done to his old friend. Bowie, how you doing, Bowie? How you doing? How are you doing? Do you remember? Can I play it? What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? Bowie, yes, it's your Bowie, yes. Your Bowie, yes. What? It was the sign Roger had hoped for. Bowie's own name. Quickly, other signs came back. Yes, you want to feed it? Okay, I'll feed Bowie. Okay, okay. And it's good, you remember. Calm down, calm down. And then, yeah. something remarkable. I had forgotten, it had been so many years, I had forgotten until all at once I thought, oh my God, that's my name. That's what he's calling me. Do you remember Roger? Yes. A simple little gesture, a finger flicking the top of an ear, had brought Roger and Bowie back 16 years. It was a nickname Bowie had invented for Roger as a young chimp. And it was, it was wonderful to see. He knew. He knew. He, knew. he remembered. It was like friends. It was just like nothing had happened. They even began to play some of the old tickle and chase games that Bowie remembered, at least as far as the limits of his cage would permit. As we watched, it became clear that the basic premise of the Great Ape Project was actually happening before our eyes. What we see in the case of Bowie being in that laboratory for all those years, and yet still remembering Roger's name, you know, we see sometimes uh, a dark, furry animal. We think, oh, how different. When Bowie signs Roger's name, we get that flash of recognition that there is a thinking being there. We've got a mind behind those bars. Hi, Demetrius. As the time to leave approached, we realized that tomorrow would be simply another day of research for Bowie. Research that may save human lives, but at what cost to those in cages who are forced to serve in our place? We've got to go now. It was very difficult because when I left, I told him I had to leave. He sort of, he accepted it, but he accepted any sort of, the, his whole demeanor went down and then he moved away. All I know is that it did make me feel guilty to have to leave him. He might expect that you'd come back again. That's why working with chimps breaks your heart a lot. You love animals. It's especially painful. How is Bowie now? What's he doing? He's fine. He's still at Lemsip, and that mm -hmm. uh, laboratory has released to retirement about 30 chimps over the years. And Dr. Mahoney thinks that uh, Bowie could be among the next ones if they get the funding for it. So that would be a good life for him if he got retired. But as you point out, this is a catch-22. You don't want experiments on human beings, yes. yet it yet it, it does. It, it it tears you apart to see it happening. So uh, w what's the solution? Well. The government could take a role in leadership, I think, in, in laying down mandatory guidelines for the retirement of chimps. They can live, like, to be 50 years old and uh -huh. older. And uh, if, if they were treated like a racehorse, it would be better. And, and we may move to that shortly. Let them I do hope. what they have to do and then give them a good retirement. Sure. Mm, I see. Well, next, you married him, but do you really know him? After 15 years of marriage, this woman discovered her husband's unbelievable secret. He was accused of... My two little girls here. Now, besides all the MCI savings every day, on Mother's Day, all our calls to everyone in our calling circles are...